So welcome everyone to our final webinar of this series. This is our 11th, and if you missed any of the earlier webinars, please go to our Field to Fork website. We now have 35 archived webinars available. So today joining me actually in my office is Todd Weinman. Todd has a master's degree in agriculture with an emphasis in horticulture from NDSU. He's a lifelong gardener and he has a lot of experience in both traditional gardening and square foot gardening. And he's really fun to listen to, so I hope that you find what he has to say today useful. So Todd, come on over. Thanks, Julie. There'll be a little extra something in your pay for that. Um, we're gonna get started here and um, should be pretty good. I believe this is the last one. Yes. Okay. All right, um, we'll skip this part. Um, there's a short survey that you want to complete later. Um, it's, um, it's very easy to fill out. I've done it, so I think anyone probably could. And you have the opportunity to win a, a prize um, for a dry. Um, it's definitely worth your time to fill the survey out. I'm going to start with this um, picture here. It is a very typical raised bed using the square foot gardening method. Um, there is so much savings with, um, well, we'll get into that, when you use this type of um, method and also the added advantage that, for example, if it rains, if you look at this picture, you can see that you can walk right out there and um, harvest or look at your garden and not be in the mud. You're not pushing down the soil, destroying the tilth, and each of these little squares is a zone, and we'll get into that a little bit more. Why would anyone want to do this? Um, you can grow, and, and for example, you had, a, let's say, a traditional garden where you have rows. You do you grow about 100% of that garden in 20% of the space, so it's quite remarkable. About a fifth of, of what it would take to grow in your traditional garden, you can grow in a, a raised or a, a square foot garden um, type of a method. You do a lot less work, 2% of the work. Uh, I'm not exactly sure if that's exactly accurate, but there is a lot less work. Um, if you don't know how, if you don't know what size to start with, I would start with a four by four um, just to get going. Many people like to do a five foot wide. The reason you do a four by four or four foot by I have four foot by ten feet and two and a half feet high. The reason that it's four feet is because the average adult can reach out two and a half feet, and you have it four feet. You're not crawling in the bed. If you have, for example, a five foot, many times I've seen people build these and they're actually crawling in the bed and kind of defeating the purpose of having the garden. Many people wonder, well, you know, I, I want to plant, but I don't really know how to do it. Um, is it just the absence of rows? Well, it is the absence of rows, but it also is if you take your garden package um, seed, for example, where you, where you buy your, the, the, the directions on your garden packet, you look at that and it'll say, for example, nine inches between plants in the row. So then you keep that nine inches away from all plants in the garden. And if, you know, and then for example, if it's, you don't have to worry about the row part because there is no row. And so you're actually using that space. Here's a nice um, grid of a four by four garden, sample four feet by four feet. You have 16 zones in this, and in each zone you could theoretically plant a completely different crop or flowers or vegetables and do quite well as long as, as you just pretended that in that one foot by one foot area, that's where, for example, the top left, say you planted all radishes in there. Follow the directions on the package, how far apart a radish should be from the next radish in the row, and you can get quite a number of radishes in there. Now, someone say, well, what if I want to grow a tomato? A tomato will actually take up about one and a half in, in two directions, or three directions actually, um, type of, of a thing. So a, a tomato will take up quite a bit of the garden here. But if you had something like beans, maybe you get maybe two in there, or peppers, maybe three, depending on the type, maybe two. Um, and, and it's very nice, and um, you save a lot that way. Here's kind of a nice colored one. Um, I put this one after it so you can kind of see, for example, if somebody had Oh, let's say you had little tiny things where you, you, you put them, you know, 16 in a block versus one versus four versus two. So you get a general idea of how the plants might look in your garden. And each little square is a zone. <coughs> We're going to touch on these um, areas here as we're going through the, through the project or through the presentation. 
um, a lot of questions I get, especially when um, it comes to seeds, is what kind to get. There's there's a big um, well, but big debate, but there is a lot of um, unknown or confusion as far as hybrid versus open pollinated or heirloom varieties. Hybrid vegetables, and both have their their uses, and both are are good in this depending on the situation. Uh, hybrid vegetables are very nice. Uh, you know, the stronger plants, disease resistant, higher yield. Many times, however, the flavor is not as good, or maybe not as sweet or not as strong. And they are very good for shipping, but as far as um, a very nice flavor, you know, it's a tomato, but it's not as good as a flavor as, for example, an heirloom tomato. And I guess that's it's somewhat personal, but I, I think that um, many people would agree with me on that. The open pollen, and also with a hybrid, um, they will not come true to form. So if you plant a hybrid vegetable, many times it'll have an F1 on the, on the picture or on the back, indicating that it's a cross. They will not come true to form. So what will happen is, say, oh, I had beautiful tomatoes. They were fantastic. It's a hybrid. You save the seed, and next year you plant them. It'll be a tomato, but it will not be the same as the one you had, and it will not be, in most cases, um, the same quality. Now, the open pollinated or heirloom, um, different flavors, different colors, uh, almost a rainbow full of colors for these. Very nice, um, different flavors that you don't always find. However, they are not as strong a plant. Um, tend to get lower yields, not as much for disease resistance. Insects seem to attack them more. I plant both just to get a variety, but um, the open pollinated or heirloom, you can also save the seeds, providing it has a cross with something. So if you had, um, you know, let's say you had yellow pear, um, tomatoes and it didn't cross anything, it'll come back true to form as yellow pear tomatoes again next year. And even if they did cross, for example, with another hybrid, um, I mean another heirloom like Roma or something, you should get a nice F1 hybrid out of it. I'm not sure what it would look like, but it would be a good plant also. Saving seeds or not, you know, if you do it right, you can actually save some money. Um, if you do it wrong, you have a, um, a season of a plant that is not um, worth growing. I've tried this before. I've saved squash seeds that I, I should have known had crossed with other squash. And what I get is um, kind of a stringy, chunky, um, almost unedible or inedible um, type of a fruit or, or squash from the plants um, instead of one that's um, that I expected. So if you have the time and you know what you're doing, sure, save seeds. But if you don't, and then that's where the heirloom or open pollinate. But if you don't, um, they're really not as expensive um, if you think about it. For example, like you get a package of carrots, there's usually between 150 to 400 carrots in a package um, that cost anywhere from a dime to a dollar ten. Um, that's a lot of carrots, and so something to really think about. Here's just some pictures of um, heirloom. Um, a lot of times they they throw organic in there, but that's a completely different topic. Just because it says it's organic doesn't mean that it's heirloom. But a lot of times they're kind of um, slid in the same area. Hybrid, we we discuss those and. Um, if you can't see on this, I do have a, I think a fuzzy picture that's coming up here with an F1 on it. But um, you know, the very next picture, if you close one eye, you can probably see um, above the carrot, it says F1. And that means that it's a cross between one heirloom and another heirloom. And they develop this really tough, super strong, disease resistant, high yielding carrot. Um, you look at the one on the right here, Kentucky Wonder Beans are heirloom. In almost all cases, they will say whether or not they're heirloom or hybrid on there. They like to, both, both, both types of seeds um, are usually um, have that on their on their on their package when you buy them. Sometimes people like to, to plant things in containers. It's like a little tiny raised bed or square foot garden. If you know one foot by one foot container, as you can see in the bottom right here. Um, but if you do do that and you want to just start with that, or you just want to start with these and move them out later, um, there are some things to think about with your containers. Which one is right? A lot of times um, people will go by, oh, that's so cute. You know, nice little metal container there in the middle. Um, metal tends to heat up in the sun and you can actually cook your plants with a, with a nice metal container. This is, um, I can say cute because I have daughters, but this is a very nice little cute container. Um, the problem is though, and I, if someone was here, I, I would ask them, but um, there is a problem with this container. There was no drainage. Here we have one with drainage, but it's um, glazed over and with a clay pot, a lot of times instead of glazing over before they decided to do that, they were for pulling the salts out of the soil. So you'd have your plant in a, in a clay pot, for example, you'd water it. Next thing you do, you get a white residue on the outside and um, that's very good for the plant. Not as um, nice looking for the homeowner, but very good for the plant. We talked about drainage and um, 
and I kind of gave away the next one here. Why water so water comes out the bottom? Um, the reason that you water so that water will come out of the bottom is that the water that we have here and in many areas has just a tiny little bit of salt in there. And so if you're thinking, oh, I'm going to save water and not, you know, water so water comes out the bottom, I will um, guarantee you that after a while, once you hit that water layer or where the water always stop, you'll actually create a salt water area and your plant will suffer or die from that. Sometimes people will take the water that came out of the bottom and, and try to run it through again. Um, you're, you're, you're defeating the purpose of removing the salts by that. Basically, you're just reapplying the salts and it, it'll get saltier and saltier as, as time goes on. <clears throat> Here's just a picture of some holes in the bottom of the container. Sometimes people will have containers and they'll say, well, then the soil comes out if there's holes in there. What I do is I'll take a coffee filter, just um, I think they're like maybe a hundredth of a penny each. They're very inexpensive and I'll stick that in there and that will stop the soil from, from running out the bottom. A lot of different types of containers. Some of them you can actually plant. So if you had your little raised bed, square foot garden, you could plant this and um, the plants roots in theory will eventually break through this coconut core and um, you're done. You don't have to try to cut it out or dig it out of there. Peat moss has been around for a long time. Newspapers is one too that, that, are, that are starting to, um, where you take like almost like a mortar pestle type of a device and make them. Um, these will, will also work for that. Commercially, they, they grow them in cells. Um, I think it's usually 72 cells or so that there, are, there is in a tray and they um, grow them that way. And as you can see, each one has at least two drainage holes in the bottom. If you like, if you're into recycling, um, here's, here's an example of, where someone has taken a um, milk carton, cut it down, made a little tray out of it. There is drainage holes in the bottom of it. And um, what will happen is, for example, these are onions. The, like a whole package was sprinkled in there. When they're about this size, they will take and cut apart the, the um, plastic container and gently put them each in their own little pot or plant them in the cells of your raised bed garden. And one thing, one, just a little aside here, when you plant onions in there, if you plant them, for example, a couple inches apart, and every week you harvest three or four, pretty soon um, toward the end of the year, you might even have to do a little bit more than that, depending on how many you put in there, um, you'll have just three large onions if you, if you kind of space them out and say, okay, this one, this one, and this one, I'm gonna leave in there. But as the time goes on, I'm gonna harvest everything in this because it's gonna be too tight as the plant grows. And that's kind of a, a fun way of um, growing onions. Here's um, another, um, you know, for commercial, you can um, put them in your pots like that. The, the, the container on the bottom of the darker black actually is a tray for collecting water. And um, it's something that you could, if you um, had plenty of water, dump it out and not use it. But these are getting close to being um, re, repotted. Not quite though, we'll get into that here. Here's some little plants that are in a um, little coconut core or peat moss type trays. And um, then they're separated out, and, and these can be directly planted right into your into your garden. Here's a side view of those. Growing in containers is very similar to growing in a raised bed. Um, you need to have enough room. If you put, um, for example, two tomatoes in a container this size, they um, they'll actually compete with each other like a weed. Here's um, just proof that it can be done. As far as uh, raised bed, same rules as a container. We kind of went through that good drainage, appropriate size. We're going to talk now about the, the right soil and appropriate material for the bed. Here's a nice little, you know, raised bed type of a, um, if you can see there, they, they've got a trellis and the, the vine crop is growing up on that. And so when you have a, a little raised bed, um, having a trellis in there is a nice way to grow your vine crops. And I, I've even seen pumpkins growing on there. Their stem gets um, quite thick or deep, I guess, um, as far as the, the diameter or circumference of the stem compared to a regular pumpkin growing on the ground. But um, they, they will hang in, in there if, you're, if your support is strong enough. Here I went out and um, got some pictures of raised beds. They are a little bit, um, there's still snow on the ground when I took these pictures. If you look at the one that's kind of in the right center, that is the, the smaller one. Um, they're, they're all four feet wide, um, the one except for the tall one to the left, that's a little bit narrower. They're four feet wide, so that's like a four by four bed and um, very nice to work with. Here's an example of somebody just throwing a little bit of wood in there to make it kind of an art. Um, as soon as the snow thaws, I'm sure that the, that'll be a beautiful little raised bed there. 
I'm not going to say where I took this, but um, it is in, in the area here. If you live in the country or um, on a farm or, or what have you, um, this is something I did when I was a, a kid in high school, or actually um, just beginning college. My mom wanted to raise beds, and so I pulled all the stock tanks we had when dad was gone out to um, a nice um, little row and um, made a very nice area with them. Cut a hole in the bottom with an ax, filled them with soil, planted them, and left. And um, they were very nice for that. They worked very well. Nice depth, easy to, you didn't have to bend over anything. And um, after a couple of years, I was allowed to come back. Um, so it worked out all right. What can they be made of? Um, if you have um, plenty of resources, cedar, of course, uh, fantastic. It, it just seems to last forever. However, um, if you're like me, a little bit low on the resources, um, pine, pressure treated wood. Um, pine is nice because it's very inexpensive, even new. And after it's done, you can just, um, it, it just kind of rots. It, it's a very, very inexpensive to use pine. Metal or plastic, um, I would go for something that was animal or food grade approved. Um, you can use concrete or stone, but it gets kind of expensive and it's not really movable once you put it in there. Um, <coughs> what not to use, um, your chemically treated, contaminated wood, um, railroad ties, all of these things have been have been known to cause problems with um, people's health when they eat the, the vegetables out of there. Um, I would not recommend it. And uh, if you had something like that, I would definitely um, put in a different type of a, a system than these. What should you use in there? Well, you can put almost anything in there. You have, um, it's a nice type A personality type of project. You, you can put in whatever you want. However, um, I recommend if you're brand new at this, um, purchasing, purchasing some nice, um, either just regular um, topsoil or um, um, some soil that's already been made by, for example, a nursery that they, they have bagged up nicely with different types of things besides topsoil. They might have vermiculite or perlite, um, some type of volcanic rock, um, peat moss, coconut core, humus. Yeah, I always say hummus. It's not hummus. It's humus um, type of a... There's, there's just tons of different things they can put in there. And so um, you can do that. Um, it can be expensive, so I would shop around. A lot of times I'll go to a nursery and say, hey, what do you use for yours if they had one there? And they tell me, and, and that's what I do, and it, it always seems to work out good. And it's nice and clean, um, and it's ready to use. You don't have to stir it. You don't have to add fertilizer. It's, and you can ask them if they add fertilizer, but usually a lot of times it comes with that. I'll talk about that a little bit. One thing, things to avoid, uh, bones, meat, and cheese. It attracts rodents, and I'm talking about rats and other, other undesirable creatures. Um, definitely don't put those in there. Um, you don't want to um, be known as the place that has all the rodents, basically. Um, Disease plant materials, um, solanacea, for example, uh, your um, tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, and potatoes are in the nightshade family. You don't want to put those in there because they, they share the similar diseases, and you don't want that, um, basically, to inoculate your soil with um, a blight or what have you from a disease plant and even though you're rotated to one of their the cousins of the, of the solanacea they'll still uh, more than likely get those diseases and very 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 difficult to get rid of weeds a lot of times we say well i'm going to throw weeds in there they have a use however if your weeds have for example seeds on them um you are making a really big problem or for example in the summertime um say you're cutting up a purslane weed you throw it in there it's almost like a starfish. If you cut it in 10 pieces, you'll have 10 little purslings growing. Um, so I, I won't recommend putting weeds in there. Uh, chemically treated grass clippings, for example, you just spray your lawn for dandelions, thistle, what have you. Um, a lot of times that will hold on to that on the, on the grass clippings. And then when you put grass clippings on your garden that you've treated with whatever type of broadleaf killer, you've now inoculated your garden. The majority of the plants that you plant out there will be broadleaves and um, get a, a number of different um, mutations and undesirable results from that. So I wouldn't use that. Um, wood chips seems like it'd be a great idea. However, the carbon to nitrogen ratio is, um, I think it's 40 to one. And so you have a lot of carbon for nitrogen and the little creatures, the flora and the fauna, bacteria and what have you in the soil that's trying to eat the wood chips will actually um, need a lot of nitrogen to break it down before they die and become plant food, kind of a circle of life or life cycle thing. It takes a long time. If you had five years, and you did the first year and not the next four, it would work out really good, but nobody really does that. And so um, I would avoid wood chips. A lot of times when you get it, um, it'll have nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, your macronutrients that are in, in majority of fertilizers. 
and there'll be some some micronutrients. You don't want to put a lot of the micronutrients on there. You can get some mutated plants from that, dead plants, um, dead zones. I would, you know, if it has nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, more than likely you're pretty good. The other ones are such a low level that you need that um, it's a good chance it's already in there. Sphagnum peat moss, perlite, uh, volcanic rock. That's nice for um, lightening it up and giving it good tilt, giving a lot of um, spaces for oxygen and, and water to percolate through there. And so that's nice to help um, loosen up the soil. People who've used coconut core, um, other, you know, actual topsoil. There's, there's a lot of things you can put in there. Um, so I guess what I would do is if you find somebody that has one that, that you really like, ask them what is in there and then maybe consider that. Fertilizer, a lot of times um, I get questions, people wanna make their own fertilizer, um, like combining different types of fertilizer. It's, it's just a nightmare. Um, what I would do is just buy it at the rate that you like, um, like a 10, 10, 10 or 20, 20, 20, you've got your nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. And there's, all, there's a lot of different variations of that. Um, I think like a 28, um, 10, two or what have you. There's, there's a lot of variations. But I would definitely, um, personally, I, if you're starting especially, I would buy it. Um, slow release or not slow release. The slow release fertilizers are, I, I love them. I, I, when I start my garden in the spring, I'll put all kinds of slow release fertilizer according to the directions out there. And I'm done. I don't even bother. I, you're, you're done for the year. It just slowly releases from these little pellets and it works fantastic, I think. If you are more advanced or, or have more time, you can go out and, and personally, um, at the right time of the year, um, fertilize your radish, your, your carrots, your corn, what have you. But um, I really don't have that kind of time and I really don't want to. So I just use a slow release. As far as organic versus commercial, I go whatever, whatever one is cheaper and um, it seems to work out just fine. Here's an example of um, three numbers. This one just has nitrogen. So you can see the point zero five zero zero. So that the first number is nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium. Here's a picture of organic um, fertilizer, bat guano or bat droppings or bat whatever you want to put in there. Um, another 13, four and 13 for the nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. Mainly you follow directions and it, it works pretty good. Let's see, we talked about this. Light, um, love sunflowers. And, um, and so as far as light, your, your best light for these is sunlight, obviously. And if it's outside and you've got a raised bed or a square foot garden, um, or even a traditional garden, sunlight. Um, eight hours of sunlight, you can grow almost everything. Um, a lot of people say, well, that's really good sunlight. And I don't know what that means. Um, say I've got two really good hours of sunlight. So I, I don't, you know, to me, if it's like two hours of sunlight and it's just sun and you have two hours of sunlight some other place and it's just sun, it's to me, it's still the same sun, and um, I don't understand where the good comes from. Um, without it, you get a lot of yield diminished uh, plant death. Sometimes I'll see people plant a little garden or raise a bed of garden underneath a tree. And I've always been wondered about that. Um, you now put the um, garden in a direct competition with a very large plant that will steal all the water, all the nutrients, all the light, and um, something has to lose there. And so um, don't put them underneath trees. Here's when you're starting your plants. Um, the grow lights are, are a lot better than they used to be, a lot lighter, a lot cleaner, and um, very nice to work with, easy to get. They're also movable, so you can move them up and down. I like to keep them anywhere between two or three inches above the plant, and as the plant grows, I'll, I'll pull it higher. Not that I'm concerned that it's going to burn the plant, but the plant will actually try to grow into it, and then um, it's hard to separate the plant from the light bulbs as it's kind of work its way around in there, so I, I would definitely keep an eye on it. Seedlings. Here's just a picture of six seeds that were planted uh, at different times, and you can see as, as it's growing. And you might think, well, the one on the far right is ready to transplant, and actually it's not. Um, the two leaves are not actually leaves that you see there, they're actually part of the cotyledon, and they're, they're providing food for the plant. So I would not say, I would say you definitely um, shouldn't transplant yet here. We talked about this. Um, you don't want to fertilize until your true leaves form. It's kind of a waste of time. Um, it might, it'll help a little bit, but I would wait till your true leaves form. Here's an example of true leaves. There's a tomato. Um, if you look, um, it almost makes like a T or an X. The, the, two, the two that are um, serrated or lobed type of leaves are the actual first true leaves. They came after the cotton leadens or the pseudo or false leaves that you see on the sides. And um, 
now I would say you could throw a little fertilizer in there. Um, you might be wondering how much. I would do about um, maybe a half to a fourth strength just to get them started. Um, if you do too much and you kill them, well, you're kind of out of luck. So by doing half strength and then increasing it as time goes on, um, it, it goes pretty good about once, once a week or once every two weeks. Hardening off, this is something that for whatever reason I hate doing. Um, it is the right thing to do. You have your plants growing, you wanna move them out. You do need to give them some time to grow um, in a little bit harsher environment. You need a protected, very safe environment with nothing bothering them ever, always getting the right amount of food and water. You move them out to the harsh climate of the outside and they can die. Um, so what I would do is um, I like to take them and put them in the shade underneath some shrubs or in the shade underneath the deck or someplace where they're, they're outside but the shade and maybe a little breeze hits them. And then the next day a little more and a little more and after about a week or so, depending on how, how fast you wanna get them out, they should be ready to, um, to plant. Biggest thing is don't let them dry out. They are um, used to being in a non-windy environment and they can dry out quite quickly. So you'll have to check them a few times um, during the day to make sure they're not, dry, not drying out. Um, if someone was here, I would say, um, are these ready to transplant or not? I could ask Julie, but she's being nice to me, so I won't torture her with this today. Um, obviously not. You can, you see, some of them haven't even come up yet. These are not ready to transplant. They don't have the true leaves. Uh, here's a couple of uh, publications that um, I think are very good that would help you with this presentation. They're linked on the site. They are linked on the site and um, well worth your time to, to look at. Here's a picture of this again, um, just to reiterate what, what we went through. If you look, it's um, non-treated wood. And I would say this is probably, I'm just guessing, you know, between you know, a foot and a half to two feet high. It's, it's marked off in zones. And so it's got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight by four. So there's 32 zones here, um, very nice area. Obviously it's four feet wide. Um, you don't have to do this string method. I have done both ways. I like the string method because to me it's like, yeah, I got a little zone out here, but it really isn't required for that. Um, and you could, in each zone, you can plant something different and it, it's very nice, or you could plant the same thing. Um, it, it doesn't really matter. I like to, when I do this here, I like to throw a flower in there once in a while just for something a little different and um, make sure the biggest thing is to follow directions with that. Now you notice there's no there's no tilt problem because you're not actually climbing into the bed. You come from the side, you have weed in there, you just pull it out, throw it on the lawn and grind it up later with the lawnmower. Um, then you water, you, you save a, a lot with water and fertilizer and sunlight isn't wasted because the plants don't have rows where that's all wasted on. Um, you control the type of soil and, and um, fertilizer that goes with this also. So very nice way of doing it. Are there questions? You can type in the chat. All right. Let's see here. So if any, anyone has questions, if you want to type them in the chat, if, you, if you've fallen asleep, um, maybe tell me what temperature it is where you're at now. <laughs> but um, otherwise, um, I, I'm ready to be grilled for questions on raised beds or square foot gardening. One thing that doesn't work well in these types of gardens I found is corn. Corn needs um, several other plants for pollination in a nice block. Um, if you plant corn in a row, you do not get a good yield. Um, many of the kernels won't get pollinated because it's wind pollinated. So corn doesn't do well in here. Um, you know, in, in certain large vine crops that will wipe out your garden, um, there are also plants that you wouldn't want to put in here. I know um, sometimes people have, you know, for example, I've, I, what I do is I'll, I'll grow them on a trellis that's hooked onto the bed for example, my cucumbers, and um, they stay off the ground, they're nice and clean, and they um, they do well on a trellis, and, and in pole beans too, obviously. So you can save a lot of space by um, by trellising in these um, little square foot raised beds. So how many tomatoes can I plant in a four by four square? In a four by four square, I say I would say that you probably get maybe two tomatoes in there. Um, the problem is that they get so big they'll crush each other out. So um, if you do a little pinching and stuff, you might be able to get three in there, like you train them so that they, they grow like a nice straight up trellis. So here's a question. Have you tried combining raised beds with low tunnel production to grow vegetables almost year round? I have, um, my wife actually bought me a low tunnel this year and we stuck it out the other night. 
Um, as far as year round, um, that would um, they would freeze hard as a rock in the winter time. Um, you know, it, it just they wouldn't be able to handle our, our cold hard winters. But if you had a low tunnel, you could get an extra two weeks of growth in the in the beginning and two weeks of growth in the end of the year, right around there. You know, not exactly maybe. So you know, between a um, three fourths of a month and a month extra growth on that. What is your oops? Should you rotate crops between raised beds on a yearly basis? Um, I'm a very strong um, proponent of uh, rotating your crops. And so if you have a little sheet of paper, you can make a map and say, for example, you had beans and peas and um, carrots here um, next year and you want to throw a tomato in there. You know, just rotate it and you, you break the disease cycles and insect cycles that are there. So yes, I would definitely rotate um, crops every year. What is your thought on the use of germinating mats for seedlings? When do plants come off the mat? I like a germinating mat for seedlings. And what is that? That is a, basically it's a, almost like a little electric blanket, but it's not, it's a, it's a plant that, or a mat that's for growing that. You put it underneath your seedlings when they're starting, gives it a nice warm temperature and the plants just take off. Um, I would, you know, for example, if you're, if you got your first, um, first or second set of true leaves, I would take it off then um, just to kind of toughen them up for the outside world as far as when to, when to take it off. Best method to keep rabbits and gophers out of raised beds. Um, a lot of times the raised bed itself will keep out the rabbits or the gophers, maybe not the gophers. Um, you know, for example, I have a two and a half foot high raised bed and I also have a, a foot high raised bed. And the two and a half high one, I've never had any animals in there. Now the foot one I have, I've had um, rabbits and, um, and more rabbits in there, I guess. The best thing for that would be fencing. You can buy um, different products. Um, plant skid sometimes helps. Um, sometimes the smell is so harsh though that you wish you had never done it, um, my opinion. And then also dried blood, you can get that from the nurseries. And um, the problem with dried blood though, it seems to attract dogs. Um, and so if you have dogs, um, they'll always be jumping around in your garden. Um, not as fun as you think. Um, so I would say, you know, chicken wire, which is unsightly, is a nice way of doing it. But a lot of times people don't want to do that because of the unsightliness, but maybe that'll become a popular thing and then um, everyone can do it. So. Any other questions? Um, these are, these have been real mind stimulating and, um, and good. I'm sure that there's probably a few others that are starting to wake up now. So if you, if you have some more questions, you can sure ask otherwise. Um, well, one other thing for um, creatures, as far as keeping them out of there, one year I planted um, in my regular garden, I put in sweet corn and I put in 10 rows of sweet corn and it just never came up. I thought, oh, the soil was too cold and it rotted. So I replanted and um, another week went by, nothing. And, and I, it's like, where is this going? And I dug down, I could not find a single seed. And so after the fourth time I replanted the sweet corn, I turned around and looked and all the morning doves in the neighborhood just flew down and went right down the row and ate every kernel of corn I put out there. And so, I went out and um, got some chicken wire and I planted it and immediately put chicken wire over the top of it. And um, I just sat on the, on the chain link fence next to it and cooed and cooed and cooed. They could not get at it. And um, probably not the best for them, but um, they had eaten so much corn now they could barely fly. And so um, it was uh, pretty good. Will raised beds require less watering than traditional gardening methods? They will require less watering. Instead of, like, for example, let's say you water a traditional garden your, um, your water will go in between the rows, which is a huge um, waste um, for, for water. Um, it just can't be helped. You could try and do like, um, for example, all different types of watering tapes and such. But if you um, just water traditionally with a sprinkler or, you know, I don't think anyone does flood gardening here, but um, with a sprinkler, there's a lot of waste with that. Um, I would say, you know, I think um, he said 20%, I would say, um, for me, more realistically, to, for me, I guess it would be more like a 50% savings in water with um, with watering the raised bed, just because um, not maybe with a square foot method. Now with a raised bed, uh, okay, I, I think I spoke wrong there. That, that was for a um, square foot garden. Now with a raised bed, you actually have to water a little bit more. Um, the reason being is that it um, dries out quicker. And so that's, um, that's why you would, probably do a little bit more. You, you'll figure it out and um, go from there. We've had great success raising garlic in raised beds. Um, I've had some success too 
as long as um, I've grown in the middle. Sometimes when I've grown it toward the edge of the bed, the, the roots of the garlic um, has gotten cold and the garlic has actually not come back or rotted over the winter or in the spring. Um, so if you're going to try to plant something like garlic, I would try it in the very middle of the raised bed and then kind of branch out from there, um, just keeping in mind that it is possible that it'll die. Um, one thing too, a lot of people don't realize, a little aside here, that you can grow garlic here. Um, you, you harvest, the, usually I harvest my garlic in the first part of July, and then I'll, I'll take it, I'll brush it off, you don't wash it, and I'll stick it in the garage in a cool, not really cool, but a dark place um, after I brush off the soil, and then it'll dry up a little more, and I'll brush off more soil. And then in the fall, probably about October, I will um, break them apart, and the really big healthy ones I'll plant, and the rest I'll eat and start up the cycle again. But once again, rotating that is, is the way to go. Any other questions? If not, um, I'll just wrap it up. We'll just wrap this up and make sure you do your survey so that you win. <laughs> well, thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Um, by the way, my name is Julie Garden Robinson, and I've been coordinating this series. And we're especially interested on the survey in you telling us what future future webinars that you're interested in. That's how we get the ideas. So please check out those archived webinars and all of the various nutrition, food safety, and horticulture publications we have on the Field to Fork site. And I think we'll wrap it up for today. I'm sure Todd would be delighted to hear from you in the future if you have other questions. I would love it. He'd love it. So thanks again, everyone. And uh, hope to catch you next time that we start our webinar series, probably in the fall or for sure next winter. Thanks.